And hello, we're back for another Wednesday night business conversation. And you may, if you're very, if you've got a very good sense of attention, notice that my normal co-host, the formidable Mr. Peter Doak, is not with us this evening. That is because he's had to go off and do something else. And he's left me in charge of the button. So if anything goes wrong with the recording, you know who to blame. Me. It's because I, I do miss you, Peter. I do miss you. But it's, everything's going to be okay because we have very kindly got a stand-in and a professional and a well-regarded and a very handsome stand-in it is too. <laughs> the magnificent, magnificent Wayne Denner. How are you, Wayne? I'm fantastic, Martin. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to stand in for Peter Doak. Big shoes to fill tonight, um, but I'm delighted to be here. And I'm glad to see that you're doing it from your very impressive studio. That is a real studio. You're not like me. You're not faking it with one of these Zoom backgrounds. This is the real thing. This is this is your place of work. Tell us about Wayne Denner, what you do and where you are. Yeah, so Wayne Denner, as you know, Martin, does a couple of different things. Uh, most people know Wayne Denner for the online safety work that I do in schools and colleges right across Ireland. Um, and I deliver educational programs in schools for children and young people around how to use the internet and social media positively and responsibly. So that's, a, a pro, I suppose, a core focus on, on what I do. I also work with parents. I work with social workers. I work with law enforcement. Uh, really, anybody who has um, a direct connection with things that happen in the online spaces uh, and how to safeguard our children and young people. The other side of what I do is I run a software platform called Cobabble, which we launched about three years ago now as a way to deliver my training and development material to people right across the world. But that has uh, changed direction uh, due to COVID. Uh, and it's now been used by a number of different companies as a way to do uh, you know, forms, audits, checklists, uh, check in and check out on the sites. It's a site safety tool effectively. So that's my software platform at uh, Cobabble. Very good, very good. But it's not just about you and me tonight, Wayne. I'm delighted and I'm honored and privileged that we have a guest to join us. And if you could press the button to bring them in, we will introduce the very, very fantastic Lisa Park who should be joining us on the screen any moment now. Hello, Lisa. How are you doing? You're, we're going to unmute you now in a wee second. Wayne's pressing the appropriate button. There we go. There we go. Hey, hi. Oh, wow. Now we can hear you and see you, and everything is well with the world. Yep. <laughs> Lisa, thank you very much for joining us this evening. This is quite a night for me. Um, two people that I've really been looking forward to. As a matter of fact, Peter and I have been hoping for some time to have Wayne on um, as a guest, just like you are tonight, Lisa. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, the stars just haven't aligned. The planets, you know, just aren't going in the right direction for all of this to happen. But come August... Um, there could well be a wee road trip on the cards um, where we may, um, depending on how busy and whether we can get a slot, be able to get up to Wayne's fabulous um, studio that you can see in the background there. And I've been there before and it is fantastic and a fantastic warm point. So we're looking forward to seeing that. But less about that and more about Lisa Park. Lisa, I could try to make an introduction for you, but it probably <clears throat> would be wrong and maybe um, set people in the wrong direction of understanding who you are. So if you could take a, a moment or so, and in your own words, tell us about Lisa Park and what you do. Yeah, no problem, Martin. Well, um, I'm founder of Studio Park Architects and I'm a registered architect. And I also teach at Ulster University. I'm a lecturer there. I uh, do that part time two days a week and um, I'm also a mother of three children um, which is also another busy job that I have um, and my business partner Ronan is actually my husband as well so he joined the business about a year after I started it. 
Um, and yes, we met 23 years ago on our first day at Queen's University. Wow. Um, and I still haven't got rid of him, or maybe he hasn't got rid of me. <laughs> so um, yeah, I suppose that's it in a, in a nutshell. Yeah, that's who I am. Very good. And I first came across you, Lisa, at a Shane McCann networking event. I think it was called The One Thing. And it was in the Law Society in Belfast. That's right. Yeah, it was a great evening, actually. I really enjoyed it. Uh Now, what were you doing there? And why were you there? What what brought you to that? Um, Well, apart from trying to escape, having to put three children to bed. um, (laughs) uh, Yeah, just um the social side of it you know um I think when you're a when you own your own business especially small business and um you know you're sort of busy with that and busy if you've got family or other uh, responsibilities in your life it can sort of your social life can suffer so um and it's also good just to get out and speak to other people that are in similar situations and you know get little bits of advice and just um share stories and um connect with people really connection that's what it's all about you know and actually that one particular evening I made quite a few connections and people that I've now built up sort of ongoing relationships with and helping each other out in business as well very good I, I think you've hit on many of the main reasons why you would go along to November God. one of the best networkers and one of the most connected people I know is Wayne Downer I mean, what's your thoughts on the value of going along to an event such as the one thing or those smaller networking events where there's maybe 10, 20 or 30 people at them? Why, why do you go to those? Well, uh, networking events, I think, are critical to, to, to small businesses in particular, but I suppose all businesses. Um, it gives you the opportunity to get out there, Martin, and speak to people uh, and put yourself in front of uh, a potential customer as well. Um, you never know who's going to be in the room a lot of the times. And, and I love getting along to network events and chatting with people, finding out a little bit more about their business, what they do, uh, what makes them tick. Um, and I think as humans, we are social beings. Uh, and we're not designed to be tucked away in the office or um, restricted from going uh, to events. And I know we had a difficult time over the past couple of years with COVID and it was challenging and we couldn't get to any of these events, but it's fantastic to see events coming back. It's fantastic to see networking events coming back. But I do love, I must admit, Martin, I love those smaller uh, boutique events, those niche events that happen, you know, that are, there's not lots of people there because sometimes if there's lots of people that can be really overwhelming, particular if you're not comfortable in that sort of environment. So those smaller events really do give a lot of people the opportunity to, to have a conversation and make a connection. Mm-hmm. Lisa, if you're at one of those events and you could bump into anybody, you know, you could choose who it was going to be. A, st- a historical figure, a person from Northern Ireland, a per- anyone any from anywhere in the world, any person at all, who would you choose? Who is it you'd want to bump into and have that conversation with at networking if you choose anybody? Oof, that's a tricky one. Um, yeah, I suppose probably someone that a lot of people wouldn't have heard of. Um, it's actually a couple. Um, they, uh, it's a man called uh, Patrick and his wife Anne Geddes. They were uh, they, they were sort of responsible for regenerating the old town of Edinburgh um, when it was a slum. And I studied a lot of their sort of work. He was actually a botanist originally. And they sort of were the the the, the parents of, of regeneration and, and urban regeneration. They're the sort of early um you know first examples really of certainly large-scale regeneration in the UK and um yeah a lot of their work has influenced my work actually and some of the research I've done and my teaching as well so it's quite a bit of a niche one um but uh, yeah just you know wish I could sometimes travel back and just sort of see what their um you know how they started it all at the time and and what their uh you know how they dealt with the situation and um yeah just so much to learn from them who is a famous glasgow architect whose museum keeps burning down oh charles rennie mcintosh um yes a question you might be able to answer i've never been sure about see the austria university at jordanstown 
is the design of it in any way based on Macintosh design, or am I just imagining that? Because I always say that's got to be, you know, something. Because I see something in the Macintosh design that, or am I just crazy? Is it got nothing to do with Macintosh design at all? What's your thoughts? No, well, they're very different styles. So I actually studied in Glasgow um, for the second part of my course, you know, the architecture course split in two parts. And um, yeah, that beautiful Glasgow School of Art building that's been burnt down twice. Um, I spent quite a few hours in there. Fortunately, the architecture department's not in the beautiful building. It's in the ugly one next to it. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, the, they're quite different. Um, Jordanstown's obviously a much larger scale, but um, yeah, I wouldn't mind bumping into Charles Rennie McIntosh either. Um, yeah, he just, he started a whole sort of almost style in architecture really um, with his work. So yeah, I suppose it's probably all those uh, older historic figures in architecture and design, you you know, I'd love to have a chat to. <laughs> and before I ask Wayne the same question, just one final question on that point for you, Lisa. What would be your first question? What would you ask those people? Just what their influences were, I think, you know, what really fired them up, what what spurred them on to do their work, you know, because they were both quite revolutionary in their time, Charles Rennie McIntosh and Patrick Amanda Geddes, you know, they um they really um made changes, you know, that have like look at the old town of Edinburgh now, for example. It's beautiful, it preserved that whole area of the city. If they had never come along you know, that the whole history of Edinburgh and how we see that city now could be completely different, you know. So it's really what what drove them on to do that, to make these changes and, um, yeah, just have the confidence to and the drive to do that. Brilliant. Well, yeah. what's your thoughts? Who would you want to meet at a networking event if you could choose anybody? If I could choose anybody, that's a great question. And I think about this often, who would I most love to sit down and have a conversation with? Um, Right now, it would have to be um, Jordan Peterson. Um, I think I've been listening to a lot of his stuff online. Um, He is a clinical psychologist, Um, fascinating character, Um, really love a lot of the stuff that he talks about. He's got a couple of books out um, and I've just ordered one off Amazon just in the past 24 hours um, called The 12 Rules of Life. Um, So I'm really looking forward to reading that. Um, And I've been following a lot of his stuff on social media, on TikTok uh, and places like that, just consuming a lot of it. So I would just love to to pick his brains uh, on on things in general. Um, He's a fascinating person. person and uh, has got great insight so highly recommend taking a look at uh, Jordan Peterson but he's the one at the moment um, that I would most like uh, to have a conversation with and meet at a networking event and hopefully at some point the other person I know there's I should be saying too is and I'm hopefully going to see this guy in Belfast in October is Professor Brian Cox he wow. is, yeah, he is doing a stadium tour of the UK. And my son is all interested in all things, the natural world and space. So we're going to get ourselves two tickets and we're going to go up to the Odyssey on in October. And we're going to have an evening with Professor Cox. So that's my other person at the moment. See, if I was asked that question, the answer would be completely different. But I was just about to ask you, Martin, yeah. who, who would be your person? Or persons. Oh, this is interesting. I wonder what you think my answer would be. I'm going to give you an answer, but and, but, and this isn't a fair question. John, it's a, it's a one word, one name answer. From what you know of me, uh, Wayne, who do you think it would be? Just give me an idea. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's just who do you think I would want to talk to? That's a really good one. Oh. See, there's so many different uh, things you're interested in that from technology to, to all sorts of stuff. Um, off the top of my head, I would probably sh- say, and I know this might be weird, the uh, the guy who's uh, going to run for Downing Street next, or who's in oh, the... Rishi. Yes, I, I I would think you would like to talk to him. I would you think would... you would have very good questions for him. That's an excellent answer. <laughs> That's an excellent answer. You know what, Lisa, I'm not going to ask that question unless you want me to ask it to you, unless you have an idea of mine, because <laughs> it'd be hard to follow that one now. <laughs> you, want, you, want, you want to give it a go? Um, I'm gonna right. say I'm gonna say Peter because you miss him so much tonight, Martin. There you go. <laughs> that, that, that's very good. That's, that's very good. 
Um, <laughs> excellent answer. Excellent answer. <laughs> very, very diplomatic. Well, I, I thought I would totally forgotten about it, Renning. But it's, it's actually, you're actually a little bit closer to the mark. We didn't give an excellent answer there. But Lisa, you're closer to the mark. It must be empathy or something that you have. Because if I, if I was at a networking event such as Digital DNA or a bar camp or a biz camp or these things that you go along to where there's hundreds of people and you're there all day and you're doing all this stuff and maybe if I was speaking at it or one of these types of things, videoing people or at a round table, the person I would really love to bump into and meet by happenstance or by accident is someone like my dad or one of my two best friends, Stephen or Chrysler who never go to events like that. My two best friends, one of them's a barrister, the other one's an engineer. I don't even think they're on the internet. I don't think they're Facebook accounts. They never talk about it. Anytime I'm like, are you on Facebook? Eh, no, we're not on that. They're not, they don't have LinkedIn accounts. Their lives outside of our friendship and my dad as well, they're just completely different. They have no idea what I do. They don't have an accountant. You know, they know I own an accountancy practice, but they've no idea what I do the networking and the people I'm connected to and the people I know and what I'm like when I'm on stage, what I'm like when I'm on these. They've never seen one of these videos. My dad and my two best friends there. And I would love to bump into them just by happenstance down in St. George's Market and say, you're in my world now. Come on to your sea and introduce them to Wayne Denner. I want to introduce them to Lisa and introduce them to all the great people that are at these events or to say, come along to my presentation where I'm going to be talking about the five top things you need to do to build a professional network or or whatever it might be I think that would really make my day yeah something as simple as that bringing people that aren't as familiar with what I do as what Wayne and James and um, I see the guys from Core Impact are on here it's probably Sean James Perry who was been on here talking before Michelle here and you all know what I do but to find those people that are so close to me that I've known my whole life who really don't know this whole aspect of my life to bring them in, I think would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, Mark. it's interesting there, Martin, just, you know, how, you know, some people are so driven to get out and, and meet others and, and connect. And then, other you know, for others, it's not really just something that comes naturally or that appeals to them. You know, we all sort of work differently, don't we? It's... um. It's just, uh, yeah, you know, why is that? Is it sort of like a personality trait or is it just, yeah, I don't know. It's just that that point came to mind there just when you were telling yeah, you. Yeah, it is. We are different. And one of the points, uh, my, my son actually makes this to me so much. We do, I mean, have you, have you, you, I mean, you were along, you were at our last pop-up co-working day and we had actually volunteered after I had asked him. <laughs> I think you compared one of the panel discussions. Would that be right? I did. Uh, one of the afternoon sessions, I believe. One afternoon session. And you were brilliant at it. You did it really, really well. But I was I was talking, we were planning that thing, and I, I was going to get, create an opportunity so that everybody was at the event would have an opportunity to speak at least for five minutes or so. And my son, who's only 21, came along to me and said, Dad, not everybody wants to speak. Not everybody wants to have a voice. And you can actually, if you're offering it to everybody and they have somebody has to refuse, you can actually put them into a situation where they feel uncomfortable. And I had never thought of that. I had just made the assumption that everybody was like me and they said, do you want an opportunity to stand up and say your name and what you do? That everybody would want to do that. But Lisa, you make a brilliant point. It's mm -hmm. not the case. And what about you, Wynne? Would you, would you always have been, and, and are you? So I, I just naturally assume that you're an extrovert. Would you consider yourself an extrovert or have you fallen into this due to the nature of what you do? Yeah, um, fallen. In, well, a couple of things spring to mind about this question. Um, as you know, Martin, um, that was my first event since COVID. Um, that was the first event that I'd been at since COVID-19 happened and changed everyone's lives. And I remember I said this at that event that day that I was really, really nervous and apprehensive about actually speaking but not only that actually coming along to the event because what happened lisa with me was i got out of the habit of attending events for the 18 months or the two years prior to that and i would have been doing lots of events up and down the country like i mean i go into schools and like a, a session for me typically in a school is 600 students packed into an assembly hall so it's not that i sort of shy away from large audiences but 
because COVID had taken me out of that zone for so long, I'd actually forgot how to network. I would forgot how to go up to somebody and introduce myself. And because we were doing it all virtually or we were doing it all on Zoom and and, and I really struggled to get back into the swing of things and, and get that mojo back. But it was interesting. And I, I know there's a question about, you know, what was our favorite job? And I, I want to kick off with that, actually, because it links really nicely into um, what I've just said a couple of moments ago. I suppose one of my favorite jobs and the job that really helped me become a better communicator, let's say, was I used to work in an amusement arcade in Warren Point um, called Slots of Fun. And anybody who used to come through Warren Point back in the day would remember this amusement arcade. It's in Church Street. And I was, uh, you know, I used to hang out there in the sort of mid 90s uh, and play games like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat and The Simpsons and Pac-Man, those sorts of games. And there was an opportunity came up at one time <laughs> in the amusement arcade, not to work in the cashier's desk, which I thought, but it was to work as a bingo caller in the bingo hall out the back. And that's where all um, the... Um, the bingo players, uh, mostly uh, elderly women, would have come to uh, to play 10p in the 10p in the slot and 10p on top. That was your opening line. And part of that job was initially to go around and sort of give people change. But as you progressed uh, and got better at that, they moved you up onto the microphone. So you had to get up and you had to do the the bingo. Basically, the numbers would come up on the screen and, you know, two fat ladies, 88, uh, Two little ducks, twenty-two. You know, I can't remember all of them now, but but that actually helped me become a little bit more confident. A behind the microphone, but B in front of people. And it was that job that I had when I was about fourteen and fifteen that really helped me uh, become a better communicator. And when I look back fondly at my jobs, that was probably one of my favorite jobs um, of all time. And I'm grateful for that opportunity because it stood by me. Uh, to this day in a lot of what I do, particularly around uh, the communication space. But that was my favorite job. But I'm going to ask you, Lisa, what, what's mm -hmm. been your favorite job? And I'm, I'm really interested actually to hear Martin's as well. But uh, what has been your favorite job? Well, if I suppose if we're talking about non-architectural work, maybe, and jobs that maybe changed us in some way, um, uh, whenever, sorry, Ronan and I lived in Australia for seven years, and whenever we moved to Australia, we taught in the university in Tasmania for a year, which was a wonderful experience in itself. But uh, whenever we finished that year, we had a choice. We're coming to the end of the year. We had a choice whether we wanted to go back home or not and or stay. And it was kind of around the recession. And we thought, what are we going home to? Let's stay. So to stay, we had to do three months farm work. And, um, you know, we've been got used to sitting in an office, maybe going out on site the odd day and all of a sudden we're faced with the prospect of having to find work on a farm for three months. So we ended up uh, working in two different jobs. And the first one was on a wildlife reserve in the middle of nowhere in Tasmania. And I have never worked so hard in my life. You know, it was physical labour, uh, digging trenches, building um bird shelters, putting on roofing, cleaning tractors, chasing birds, getting almost eaten alive while trying to collect eggs, you know, just up at the crack of dawn, five o'clock every morning, you know, just any job that needed to be done, you just did it. There was myself and Ronan were there, we were traveling together at the time, us, my husband and my business partner. And um, yeah, it just toughened me up for want of a better phrase, you know, um, but also in the most beautiful setting, um, you know, and very enjoyable. It, it sort of showed me that hard work can be enjoyable and satisfactory. And yeah, you know, we had moments where I was thinking, what are we doing here? You know, um, when you're sort of you know you get torrential rain sometimes or you're out working all day and that and but you just keep going because the work had to be done the you know the, the reserve had to go on the guests coming and people coming to look around and we were the main staff believe it or not at the time so they just find it so hard to get staff because of it was so remote um and and people that were willing to just do whatever you know and and following that we spent a month on a raspberry farm and um, in scorching heat collecting raspberries um, and I realized now I'm actually allergic to the raspberry plant um, <laughs> so I effectively had mumps for about a month but also again just that perseverance 
you know, and just do whatever needs to be done and see, find the enjoyment in it. And we did have great fun around the campfire in the evenings, waking up to wallabies. We stayed in a tent for a month. Um, it was a life changing experience working in those two places. And, you know, I will never forget that and the lessons that I learned from those two jobs within that three months. So, yeah, just, you know, talking about non architectural work, that would be what jumps to mind. So I'm interested to hear Martin's now, actually. I, uh, my dad's a serial entrepreneur. He, he's, he does well. He's one of these people that will try anything. And no matter what he tries, it's always successful. And the reason it's always successful is that he absolutely believes in hard work. And he understands what the word grit means about not giving up, about not being deterred, about not being distracted, about all this stuff, face your fear and do it. I mean, you would never use those words, but that's what he emulates. So he decides to do something and he does it. Um, his first business which he started when he was about, um, before I was born. So he was married when he was 20 and I was born when he was 21. And he opened a butcher shop in a place called the Bull Ring in West Belfast, in the middle of the troubles. And the funny thing about, the only thing I remember about that butcher shop was there was bullet holes <laughs> in the walls. And I never thought about it until afterwards, but he was starting a business at a time it was very hard to start a business anywhere. But he was trying to start a business in one of the most difficult places that you could probably start a business. So he had this drive, but he didn't he didn't remain a butcher forever. He, he, he became a publican. He had bouncy castles. He went into the building trade. He flew diggers and all this type of stuff. And from about the age of about 11 or 12, he brought me with him. His view was, well, if you're old enough to, you know, Sky, if you're old enough to work, you know, he wasn't going to come home and have me see me lying on the sofa when he'd been back from a hard day's work. So on the weekends and the evenings, I would I would go work up, go working with him. And I decided in my great wisdom, um, about when I was about 15 and a half, before I was 16, I was leaving school. School wasn't for me. And my granny tried to convince me, my mom tried to convince me, everyone tried to convince me that don't leave school. You'll ruin your life. Okay, I'll, I'll, you, need, you need an education. My dad didn't try to convince me. What he said was, son, uh, you leave school. I have no problem with you leaving school. To see the day, the morning after you leave school, you come home, put your uniform away, do whatever you want with it. The next morning, you're coming to work with me. Well, yeah, I'll be happy. I'll be glad. I'll go to work with that. And he started at half five in the morning. He left the house to go to the building site. And the job he was doing at the time was putting drains in round houses and doing big pavement slabs and grounds work, it's called, putting down driveways on. And it's the dirtiest, muddiest, coldest, most miserable job that you can do. But I had brought it upon myself. So I had no excuse. I couldn't get out of it. And it was grim, like mud everywhere, freezing cold, even in the middle of the summer. And about nine o'clock, we used to see there was a wee site off, so miserable we hope now. But when I look back at it, the, 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 there was ladies who worked in there, did the administration of the site. And they would come in at about nine o'clock and they'd turn on the light and they'd put on the kettle and the windows would steam up. I thought they got to work in heaven because it was warm and there was cups of tea and toast and all the rest. And that job was grim. But there was something about getting there in the morning and getting home in the evening when we were sitting in the van with the other lads sitting in the front. And I was a wee fella, like 16, naive, didn't really know anything. But just being there with my dad and the other lads, knowing that I had absolutely done a hard day's work. And I, my dad being proud of me and saying, look, son, you did a good work day's work today. He never went, I'm proud of you. But he would say, did, you did well, or we got that done, or I'm pleased we got that done. And driving home in the van, with the guys completely exhausted to the point when we got home, we had our dinner and we fell asleep. Me and my dad would be like cocked out in the seats in the living room. That for me was the best job in the world. I've never been prouder. I've never been, until I started working with Michelle and I love what we do here at Gilchrist and COVID in a different way. But as a young man starting out and being part of that, you know, it really, and it's still, when I, when I think back on it now, it still affects me because it was so special. I'd never go back and do it again, but
but at the time, you know, it was fantastic. Fantastically grown. That's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I think on that, sorry. There's a bit of a, a common theme there, I think, and that, you know, um, it's just really sort of learning the hard way and putting in the, you know, it's perseverance, isn't it? And mm -hmm. it's that satisfaction of a sort of physical day's work as well that you don't get from sitting on a desk, you know. I think there definitely is. And with that in mind, in your opinion, Lisa, and it, this is slightly different, but it's in the same track. In your opinion, what's the most important personality trait or strength that somebody would need to do the work that you do? What, what is it you need to be a really good architect? Um, I would say attention to detail because um, in, a, in a number of ways, obviously the work that we do, there's the construction details. If you take it literally, um, you know, and, and design and all of those, but it's from the first day when you meet your client or prospective client um, catching all the little details and the subtle things that they want in their brief that they maybe don't even notice themselves you know when you're walking around that first conversation whether it's a site or a building it's really paying attention and noticing little things and gathering all those little pieces of information up and then translating that into the design and that level of detail has to continue right through until it's finished on site and that's that makes a difference between in my opinion between an amazing, excellent architect and an okay architect. That is the difference for me. It's it's to do with the, the detail. Yeah, I think I, I think that's true of any professional under any sort of architect. Well, and before I ask you the, the same question, I note that there's a couple of guests on here with us. That are, um, yeah, audience. There's audience members on with us. James Perry, great guy. Good to have you on, James. James, don't be afraid to ask any questions. What we'll do in the last 10 minutes or so, Wayne, if there are any questions, We'll take turns in reading them out and giving these people a shout out and giving everybody a chance to ask Lisa or, or any of us or any of us questions. So James, the guys from Core Impact, as I say, I think it's Sean Grant is with us this evening. And Michelle, certainly feel free to, uh, to ask questions and, and also tell us a little bit in the, in the feed about your website or anything you need us to share it. Let us know. We will definitely do that in the last 10 minutes from about 12.45 onwards. Wayne, that same question to you, what you do. What, what do you need to be really good in your field? Yeah, I suppose, you know, attention to detail, I suppose, is really important as well. I think that's important for um, a lot of a lot of us, you know, no matter what we do, you know, um, you know, having that ability to, um, you know, a client gives you a brief or you have a, you know, a, a project to deliver. You got to make sure that, you know, you're, you're delivering it to the best of your ability and you're paying attention to these smaller things. I suppose when I was younger, those are things that I wouldn't have been that particular about. But as I've got a little bit older, I've got better at, um, you know, making sure that I'm over delivering, if that makes sense, um, as opposed to under delivering. Um, I'm always trying to deliver a, a service to a high enough quality that, you know, people are going to remember um, and they're going to want to work with me in, in the future. So I like to go above and beyond and I like to really make sure that, you know, if they ask me to do X, Y and Z, I try and do a little bit more um, than X, Y and Z. So I think that's that's a really important um, skill. Um, I think it's something that you don't necessarily pay attention to when you're younger. I remember in some of the jobs I had over the years or even some of the businesses that I was involved with, it was all about just getting it done, getting it out the door and getting the money and moving on to the next one. Um, as I've got older, it's been less about that. And it's been now trying to to really build up long term relationships so that there's lots of um, kickback in terms of repeat work and people go away feeling good uh, about what I've done for them or what I've delivered for them. So I think for me, yeah, it's probably similar to what Lisa's already said, Martin. Okay. I think my answer to that would be, I think there's a one word answer which covers a whole lot of stuff. And that word is trust. Trust. In any professional field, what you have to win is the trust of your clients. Um, and how do you build trust? You can't buy it. You know, you can't put it in a wee box and hand it out to people. Oh, there you go. Here's, here's the trust. You can't give somebody a tablet and say, here's a tablet. You have to trust me. There's something about trust. 
that and we all know what trust is, but if you had to give de- trust a definition in professional services, what would that be? It might be a little bit different for all of us. But trust is essentially the point of view where I think trust is when somebody looks at you and says, you're going to do what you say you're going to do, even though I'm not there. It's going to work. It's not going to cost me more than it should cost me, but I'm going to pay a fair price. I'm going to pay the value of what I do. You're going to be a professional and you're going to do the right thing, whether it's what I want or not. You know, you're, you're going to stand by what is the right thing to do and you're going to keep me out of trouble. You're going to take responsibility. You're going to take responsibility for yourself, for your professional actions, for your professional capability, for the work that you do. But not only are you going to take responsibility for yourself, but you're going to take responsibility for what I've done. So if my client comes to me and they've done something wrong, I go, ah, you made a mess of that. Anything goes wrong is your fault. No, they trust me to take on that problem and to resolve it for them and to take responsibility for whatever they have done wrong, within reason, obviously not breaking the law and being devious and being malicious and all that type of stuff. But we all know what we're talking about there when you take responsibility for your class things. So if somebody asked me what is that, what's the answer to that question? If you could sum up one word, it's trust. If somebody asked me, well, explain that, I could sit all night explaining what I thought trust was, but I think, I think we all know what it means and, and what it boils down to. So, uh, yeah, that's the answer. I think that's a very, very good answer, Martin. Thank you. And I didn't even <laughs> reverse it or anything. It's, and it, it's, it's funny as well, Martin, you know, the, it's those first impressions. I think you mentioned that on one of the other chats you had previously, um, you know, you can almost decide that you trust someone so quickly as well you know it's that sort of first impression you know what is it why why do you get that sort of feeling that you can trust that person so quickly and but yeah it's it's uh, the first impression is so important yeah yeah and, and hopefully i'm hoping the first impression i give is one that's trustworthy i think there's a thing about that as well people talk about the word that's used is vulnerability so apparently if you read these books about how you create good relationships and build trust and build credibility they say you have to be vulnerable but I think what they actually mean by vulnerable is you have to be honest mm. you just have to tell the truth and not try to be something that you're not yeah. and not try to hide like you don't have to tell everybody all your issues and problems but you at least have to admit when you're not the person that they need. And that's a very important thing, Joseph Gilchrist and Co. We know we're not the accountants for everybody. And the, in the very first conversation, we will say, right, let's sit down and see if we're the right person for you. Because we want to find out right away if we're not the right person for them. Now, we're lucky that our profile and our brand is out there so much that very few people come towards us without knowing who we are. But even having that sense to say, no, we, we, we don't know enough about R&D tax credits. We don't know enough about tax planning to be able to help you with that. That's not what we do. Or other truthfulness, vulnerabilities. You know, I think, I think that's also a very, very important thing for trust. Yeah, we would be the same here, Martin. You know, that's um, the first phone call would really be to you know it's for the client's benefit as well so they're not wasting their time speaking to us if we're not the right architect for them um and, and vice versa it has to work for everyone so you know we do advise people to go to maybe another business or maybe they just need a contractor to go directly if they don't actually need an architect um you know so it's 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 works better for everyone if you're open and honest from the start and, and honest with yourself as well about what type of projects you want to take on as a practice and what type of clients would benefit most from what we have to offer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we've all, we're all saying the same thing, Jeter. Wayne, yeah. Wayne, 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 you're a busy man. I know how busy you are. But <laughs> I'm trying to get you slotted into what we're doing and, and, and the same way we're busy as well. We're all busy people. It's, it's the nature of professional services. You just we're a time-based service. We have to use our time to do what we do. And you never have enough time. 
I honestly believe that most small business owners don't have enough time to do the stuff that they have to do, never mind the stuff that they would like to do. So therefore, we have to find ways to manage that productivity. Wayne, what is your favorite productivity hack? You're going to say cool babble. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is an excuse to tell us about Cobalt, but what is your favorite product, product type that you have? Um, the, the one, and it's probably going to sound um, strange to a lot of people, is um, I, I don't focus on a specific start or finish time any day. Um, okay. So I, I don't typically start at nine o'clock and I don't ever typically finish at five o'clock. Um, sometimes, depending on how I feel, and I think this is really important. Um, I think depending on how I feel from the day before, will determine um, if I lie on the next day uh, and I don't start work till 11 or 10.30 or, or in some cases like today, 12.15, because I didn't get up until about 10.15. And then I went to... Train. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I just, I've done this for quite some time um, and I feel that it's it's been super beneficial for me, but super beneficial for the people that I've had to do work for. Um, because when I'm doing the work, I'm at my optimum. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm focused on that. I'm, you know, I haven't started really early or I don't have to finish really late. Like today, for example, I went out to Kilbrony Park and I walked my dog and I strolled around the park. And I think I eventually got into the office about, about quarter to one um, by the time I went back to the house and dropped the dog off. Um, but you know what? I, I, I worked straight through to five o'clock. Um, there was no breaks. Everything was work, work, you know, straight through the stuff. Um, I went home for a little bit back in tonight and I'll probably do after this tonight, another, maybe about one hour after it. And then I'll, then I'll go home. Now tomorrow I'm actually thinking about starting at, uh, 8 15 tomorrow. So I'm already starting to think, you know, I'm going to do a little bit of an earlier start today. So for me, my productivity hack is listen to your body. Um, I think that's really important. And I think you have to do that. Now I had a couple of health issues along the way that's made me come to that decision. Um, when I was younger, I was, you know, I was really, really working hard and I was working a lot um, and that had an impact on, on my, on my health and well-being. So what I find is, you know, listening to your overall body, uh, what your body's telling you, and then taking steps around that, that you can maybe go out for a walk, uh, you know, even during the day, you can get yourself away from the desk and get out and even have a conversation with somebody. I feel that's really, really helpful. So, so my productivity hack is, is just that, is listen to your body. That is brilliant. I, I, that, that was not, <laughs> if, if somebody had given me a thousand pounds, guess what Wayne's productivity <laughs> hack is going to be? I would never have guessed that. Very, very good. You probably thought it would be some bit of tech or something. Yes. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. A lot of people would have thought that. Well, yeah. yeah, about Lisa, me. What's yours, Lisa? Um, well, a bit like Wayne there, I would have uh, worked quite long hours when I was younger, especially when we were working out. I was an associate in a practice out in Sydney. It was quite a big international practice with over 100 staff and I was running a team. And I just ended up doing, I think I did like a 92 hour week, one week, you know, I got really crazy at one point and that was fine. It was when I was a bit younger, obviously, it was a bit more fit and able, but um, you know, obviously now I run my own business as well, trying to make sure that you're taking that time away to, you know, to switch off from your work. I mean, the other thing that I have in my life that takes up a lot of time is my children. So um, especially over the summer when you've got different drop offs and pickups and things like that. So I find that what works best for me is to work in very focused chunks. So the way that I deal with my life basically is whatever I'm doing at that time, I'm fully focused on that, whether it's, you know, I'm in work or if I'm looking after the, if I'm with the children or if I'm trying to take a bit of time out for myself and everything else has to wait, you know, and whatever I'm doing at that time. So if I'm in work on a fixed task, I just try and switch off from everything else and, um, I also, you know, will will set myself a time to get that task done because I have to be quite efficient. And, and my old boss in Sydney actually said, and it always stuck with me, that he loved employing um, people that had to leave at a certain time every day because they were the most efficient staff. So in a way, it's kind of the opposite of what Wayne's saying in one way or a, diff a different way of looking at it. But um, my time is very, um, you know, sort of controlled and I have to get into work at a certain time and leave. So interestingly, it's quite different way in there. But 
to sort of manage that then I break it every, my whole day down into chunks and I focus on on whatever I'm doing at that time yeah I think mine's would be closer to yours Lisa than it is to Wayne's I love Wayne's and I, I I think I can see the benefits of that I'm gonna have to think about working with that but mm -hmm. when we work in the work that we do so we do four things at Gilchrist and Co. Very simply, self-assessment tax returns, corporation tax returns, VAT and payroll. Uh, those are our four services. And if somebody came to us and asked to do something else, no, we don't do something else. That's it. And all of those services have deadlines. A self-assessment tax return has a deadline. Corporation tax returns have deadlines. VAT has deadlines. Payroll has deadlines. Now, if you imagine 300 clients, so that's the maximum clients we will have in Gilchrist and Co. And each one of those clients could have an annual corporation tax return or an annual um, confirmation statement. They may also have quarterly VAT returns, or they may also have weekly or monthly payroll, all at different times for different clients, different places, different things have to be done. And they all have to be done continuously throughout the year. See if you looked at that for 300, if you, you can imagine doing your bookkeeping for yourself and then multiplying that by 300, your brain would pop. You just go, how do you remember? How do you get everything done? And then people are bringing in books late. They're bringing in incomplete records. They're bringing in, you know, people just don't turn up with all the right stuff in the right order and say, there you go. This is perfect. Make it work, you know. And um, if we didn't have a system, we'd be dead by now. <laughs> Literally, the stress would kill you. Because can you imagine we have much wood? Hold on tight. Um, I'm turn my phone down here. Sorry about that. Um, we have yet to miss a deadline for any clients in the 15 years. 300 clients, all those different services. 300 clients. How do we do that? What is our productivity hack? It's a little bit of what you say, Lisa. We boil it down to we block off our time. So I I would get up in the morning if I would have to be starting off to say it was eight o'clock. And before 11, I'm going to have all my credit control and bank reconciliations done for that morning. That's the deadline. Now, if I know I have 30 transactions to reconcile, I will bring it down. Well, how much time does it take for each one? I will time myself doing the transactions to make sure that I'm working fast enough to get the stuff done. But we've already we've done it so many times. So self-assessment, actually, how long will that take? We know how long it takes. So we schedule the time and we do nothing else until that's done. So we know if the number of tax returns, how many tax returns we have today a day, how many corporation returns we have to do a day. And we work quickly, but efficiently with enough time to get that done. We don't take on any more work. If we know that we're full for that week, we'll not try and squeeze any more in. We'll just not take any more work. We know how long the task takes. We allocate the time for the length of time that work takes. And we do the work in the time that we've allocated for it. You follow those rules and you know you're getting everything done. Doesn't matter that we've got 300 odd self assessment tax returns to do and that 150 of them might not come in until the 1st of January. We allocate the time, we know when it has to be done, we do it when it has to be done, and we can trust the system then to know that it will be done. And when you've got a system and you follow that, it lifts so much stress off you. In fact, we have a thing called the magic number. This, we have a whole lot of little tools and devices that we use to make sure that we get all the work done when it has to be done. But one of the things we use as a as a as a ready measurer, re, re, ready measurer. What, what am I trying to say there? Ready measurer. Is that an expression? A ready measure is, I think. A ready measure. Yeah, a ready measure of something. Yeah, oh, yeah. I know it is. Yes, good. Uh, um, <laughs> one of the things we do is that we we have a list of all the self assessment tax returns, for example, that we have to do. They must all be done by the 31st of January, 2023. We know how many days are left until the 31st of January, 2003. And we simply divide the number of tax returns by the numbers of days left. If that number stays less than three, we know that we have to do less than three tax returns a day. And that means if we always have less than three to do a day, we know we're always okay. That's a nice wee ready measure to make sure. And if it goes above three, we know we need to pull the finger out and work a little bit harder. So if you have those systems in place, if there's a process, if the process works and you trust the process, you're always going to be on top of your game. That's how we do it.
Um, you're you're kind of reminding me there, Martin, of the way that I would maybe speak to some of the students in the university when I'm trying to get them to work towards their deadlines. Yeah. And it's funny because, um, you know, what Wayne's saying there about, you know, listening to your body, like actually students are quite good at that because some of them will turn up at sort of 3 p.m. in the afternoon and work to 3 p.m. at night because that's what they want to do and they can do it and others will come in early and do sort of normal working hours and you know you can see that that does work better for them you know and it's definitely something that I would like to I'm not a morning person I like to have a slow start and you know have a bit of quiet time and an exercise and we have that same issue in, in a sense that you do Martin with all the deadlines so sometimes I'm kind of almost forcing myself to start my day, you know, and you're sort of having to ignore what you're saying, Wayne, and listening to your body and just say, no, I've got this deadline. Forget about that. Move on, you know, but I see it in the students and some of the best students work the oddest hours and, you know, that works for them. So why not? As long as they their deadlines. <laughs> I'll have to introduce you sometime. Lisa to James Perry, who's on this evening, and he's actually told us Ready Reckoner is what I was trying to say. He knows mm -hmm. me better, I know myself. Ready Reckoner is the expression. Um, James Perry is an exam coach. So he's, he's also a qualified and highly experienced FCA chartered accountant. So he's a senior member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Still a very young man, in, only in his early 40s. Um, mm -hmm. But he has a very successful exam coaching business and he coaches young. Um, chartered accountants who are going through their exams from all over the world. And he also works in, in the university as well. Um, but he's all about that. He's all about how do you get through your exams? And a lot of it is about being organized and That's sticking amazing. to the rules. And, but what you learn in the exam process is what prepares you for life. Um, yeah. Wayne, would you agree? Yes, I was typically not very good at exams in school. Um, I know you have a question tonight. What was your favorite subject? Um, and that was one we'll probably talk a little bit of that. But but I was, and, and, you know, that's one of probably my regrets, actually. Um, you know, but I've got better at it. I have got better at it. Um, I'm more structured now. I'm more organized. And, and I do slot things in and around, uh, you know, what needs to get done, you know. And, and also the thing about me is, and it's interesting, I was listening there to what Martin was saying and a question that sort of sprung into my mind. Do you think that that's specific to a certain industry? What you've just outlined, Martin, is that is that a typical accountancy thing? You know, that yeah. may not be applicable to another sector or another industry um, where it's yeah. very applicable to that. Uh, and, it, and it should be. It sounds like that, that that's the way it should be because of the things that have to get done by the certain deadlines and the tax returns and all that sort of stuff. But I wondered, and I was thinking about this because I have a software company in, in my mind, you know, is, you know, am I sort of up against those similar things? And the, 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 one of the reasons why I get to do what I've outlined earlier on was that my software team is the other side of the world. So pretty much what happens is when I wake up in the morning, there's a ton of work already done. And I know that ton of work's already done. So that I don't have to review that till probably later on in the day because the client's not expecting it till later on in the day because there's a nine hour difference. So that works really, really well for me, but I still have to be organized in the sense that um, I've got to make sure X, Y, and Z is, is done. But I was just wondering that, is it a, is that an accountancy thing or is that a, is that, what is it like that in other sectors? But it is, it must be because Lisa's already said it's like that in, in her sector so maybe yeah. maybe there's it is a, there's a there's a culture of long hours and architecture that is sort of instilled from you know university days um i know up at queens the the architecture department on touring gardens um the the students called it the the vampires um you know the vampires haunt or something like that you know they used to joke with us all the other students because they'd walk past from their night site you know, after the bot or whatever, and see all of us in over our drawing boards drawn away. And, you know, it's it's really uh, an issue, I would say, in the industry, because you sort of feel like you have to do all this overtime and you have to do these long hours to prove yourself. And it's certainly an expectation when you go into practice as well. And it's something that we here in Studio Park do not do. We encourage staff to leave on time every day. We don't do unpaid overtime, um, which is a, a problem as a result of this culture of sort of sitting in the office to look like you're devoted to your job. 
you know, and I think hopefully COVID and working from home has kind of stamped a bit of that out. But um, yeah, it's sort of, you know, something that, um, you know, needs to be addressed within certainly the architecture industry. Is it a real deadline or are people just trying to look busy because they feel they should, you know? Yeah. I think, it, I think it's a challenge in most of the professions. Guys, I have been loving this so much that the time has flown in. We're, we're up to almost an hour already. And although I would love to chat on, and I have so many questions that I wanted to ask you, Lisa, that I didn't get the chance to ask you, but like the art, art industry that, that goes mm -hmm. into architecture and the creativity. And there's a whole lot of stuff that I want to ask about that. I see um, the guys from Core Impact that had some really good questions there, such as, what has been your greatest challenge in business so far and what is your vision for the future? I would have loved to hear your answer to that. Um, James Perry, he's talking about the, the same in accountancy, particularly in big practices conditioned to work long hours. Um, and all that, you know, the comments that are coming through in regard to all this are fantastic. I would love, we have, if only we could talk on for mm -hmm. another half hour, just another half hour with Lisa yeah. and me and would have been so fantastic. But we have to live in the real world and realise that it would just be, what, what is it? Ego, my only ego would be getting stroked here rather than helping the viewers. So I, I think we're going to have to cut it um, cut it to an end now, if that's okay with you, Wayne, and with you, Lisa. But before we do, um, Lisa, I'm going to give you the penultimate comment, question, suggestion. So what, what question should you have been asked? Um, which I mean, and what was your answer? What would your answer have been? Oh, now you're putting me on the spot, Martin. Um, I suppose just you know, it's kind of a what would I like to be remembered for question, I suppose. Um, and the one that you know, you mentioned there, you know, about we we're talking if you won 10 million pounds, what would you do with it? Sort of yes. rolling those two together. Um, and you know, one of my sort of passions in architecture is creating um buildings that are healthy and that are beautiful and a joy to use and um will be loved and used for many many years because that's sustainable in itself in that the building is um you know lasting for a long time and and not having to be rebuilt or replaced and really you know I think I would I would love to if I won lots of money I would love to um come up with uh, sort of um, sustainable small homes that could be um, put towards solving, for example, homelessness issue, and but also just affordable, affordable homes for, you know, first time buyers, families that are actually healthy and sustainable because some of the products that we use in our homes are not healthy and not good for the environment and, part of living in a healthy home is to bring joy and to feel good and have a happy life. And I'm also interested in the impact of the spaces around us psychologically, you know, the, the smells, which can also come from the materials, the colors, the air that we breathe, fresh air, um, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, just, creating beautiful buildings that stand the test of time and are healthy and enjoyable for people to live in and use and to um, be able to make that affordable and achievable for more people in the world at the risk of sounding completely cheesy. <laughs> no, you literally need more people like you, Lisa, in the world. The world would be a much better place if everybody thought in that had those sensible way of thinking with so that's absolutely fantastic and a, and a fantastic way to finish your conversation. Wayne, what's your final words for this evening? And you're absolutely right, right? Round of applause. Um, Lisa, but what's your final thoughts, words for this evening? Well, I really enjoyed the conversation uh, this evening, Martin and Lisa, and you can see how quick the time has moved in. And I just thought there was so many interesting things being covered. Um, that I, I also, Martin, could could have sat on for another half an hour easily, but it would be unfair uh, to keep Lisa around. And I thought that your final sort of um, point there, Lisa, around, you know, the homelessness and, you know, 
but making buildings, you know, more sustainable. I think that's so important and, you know, making houses and homes more affordable because people spend an awful lot of time in their homes and it's nice for those homes to be, you know, really well put together, but also healthy spaces. I think that's really important. So it's interesting to hear uh, that chain of thought from you tonight. And no doubt that's something that conversations are happening in your profession uh, people yeah. are thinking about those things so it's, it's great to hear that 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 there is a conversation going on um, about that so thank you so much for for, for sharing that and as well as all yeah. uh, the other information you shared tonight I'm delighted to be here okay as for closing and final thoughts the first thing I obviously have to say is thank you very much guys um absolutely fantastic conversation this evening I really felt engaged you know motivated and inspired by a lot of what I've said tonight. Wayne, you're going to be hitting the stop record button now and just to finish once I make my final comments and it will be over. We'll be will be done. Don't just turn off your computer, Wayne and um, um anybody who's on actually if, if you want to say hello before we shut off before before the recording goes do do um do stay on and Lisa um I appreciate we all somewhere to go but I would like to have a final you know Sure, we'll have to stop the recording. Um, to anybody that has watched it all the way through to now, if you've watched this for an hour, I hope you've got the same value out of I did. If you've got the same value, and I say this every time, go and push the subscribe button. It's on, <laughs> it's on the YouTube thing. It should be up there or somewhere. You know, hit it. We've got 23 subscribers. You know, we're changing the world, whoever those 23 people are. Um, so definitely hit the subscribe button. If you would like to join us in the same way that uh, Wayne and Lisa have this evening and enjoy these fantastic conversations, even, even if nobody else was watching this, nobody, if nobody else watched this back, this would have value in itself. The opportunity for me to meet you, Lisa, to learn more about you, to feel that connection. I, I, I can see us talking again about other stuff in the future. It may not be a recorded, broadcasted live thing, but definitely there will be opportunity. And you and me, Wayne, we're always up to mischief. Well, of course, <laughs> we're, we're always up to this. So anybody that's watched this but what far through, um, if you would like to be one of these conversations, just reach out um, to myself or Peter Hope and, and we'll get you on. And if you think it's worth it, share it with your friends and family in the world. We'd be very grateful. And on that note, I shall say, cheerio. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. Thanks, Swain. <laughs>